I want to thank you for, 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 for joining Agile Camp. I want to introduce Rich Mirnoff. And uh, Rich is just, uh, just an awesome guy. So I met Rich at the Silicon Agile Leadership Network. We invited him. We weren't sure who this guy was. And he wrote this book. And it sounded kind of interesting, The Art of Product Management. And me being a product manager at Oracle for some time and, and working in product management for a, a good part of my, my uh, career, I thought, well, who's this guy knowing what product management's all about? Especially agile product management? What is, what is this? So when he came in, it was, uh, it was recorded. We actually hosted this at LinkedIn. And I don't think Rich even knows this. So LinkedIn is really clever. They record everything and they make it available on Ustream, which is really cool. So you can dial in and watch all of our Agile Leadership Network um, uh, events. And it turns out that his talk ended up being the most, one of the most popular talks that we ever videoed. And, uh, and you don't know that. Now you do. <laughs> and so with, with that, you know, Rich has really made an amazing impact on the industry. Um, Rich has founded, uh, founded a company called Entheosis uh, way back when. He's given a lot of consulting to leadership at a variety of different companies within Silicon Valley. And he is an expert in product management. And my mind has shifted from, how does this product owner thing in product management where they fit? It's kind of hard, especially coming from product management and understanding, well, how does working with external marketing and my clients work with internal development? How do I work with my teams? How's this sort out? I don't have enough time. So there's a lot of challenges within that. And uh, through Rich, he's helped me kind of think that through. But he's, he's a lot more than, than product management. He's, he's overall, general, how do you run your, your, your business? How do you grow business value in, in your company? So with that, I'd like to hand, hand, off, uh, hand off the stage to Rich Mirnoff. Do you have a clicker? All right. Green for go ahead. Great. Thanks so much. Am I mic'd on? Perfect. Um, right, so we're going to talk actually uh, about ice cream. But before we get there, uh, just uh, I, I brought a couple of books. Yes, I, I actually did write the book on product management. We're going to give some of them away. So, so this is supposed to be interactive, even though it's 9 in the morning here or 7 o'clock in San Francisco, where I'm from. Um, but uh, who here in the audience is a product manager? Wow, good. I, I owe you guys a debt of thanks. If you can keep your hands down for a second, uh, who among the rest of us uh, is in an organ a team or an organization where we love our product managers? Ooh, a lot more hands than I expected. So I spend, I spend a lot of my time with one foot in the engineering or the IT or the development organization and one foot on the product owner, product manager, product strategy side trying to do what's effectively marriage counseling. Because <laughs> when I just talk with the scrum teams and the development organizations, I hear all kinds of things that honestly aren't so printable about the product managers. <laughs> and when I talk with the product managers, I hear the other half of the story. So, uh, so my job most of the time is to help folks bridge that gap, bring it back together again, and find the, the, the joy and the love and the great products that we have to build in order to satisfy the market um, without getting into name calling. Good. Which brings us back to ice cream. So uh, for anybody who's, who's as old as I am and remembers the space program and how exciting it was, there was this stuff that they sent up with the astronauts, and it was? It was astronaut ice cream, right? And what was it? It was kind of like those little dip and dots. Almost. Yeah, so it's the precursor to dip and dots. It was freeze dried, and it tasted a little bit like chalk, and it felt like chalk, and it looked like styrofoam, good. And, and you know, had, <laughs> had the consistency of styrofoam, but it, but it had the sort of Neapolitan colors, right? You had the sort of brown, and sort of pink, and sort of white, right? Um, <laughs> You can get them in that, and we'll see the we'll see the little bags in a sec. But but most important for this discussion, what it wasn't was ice cream. Okay. Now it's called astronaut ice cream, but we're going to notice that it's not ice cream. Okay. So, um, ooh, that's better. Okay. Seeing double there for a second, right? So so I'm going to talk about the, the the challenge of unpacking business value, and I'm going to use it sometimes in quotes. And when I use it in quotes, what I'm talking about is that little tiny number on the corner of the spreadsheet or the corner of the card or the corner of the ticket where somebody who's not you has written a number that you believe. 
Okay? And when I take the quotes off, I'm going to be talking about real value that the customers who pay your salaries, because they're not the business unit heads, they're the folks who pay your company's money, want. Okay, so that'll be an interesting distinction between the freeze-dried ice cream that isn't really ice cream but pretends to be ice cream and the real thing which is fun dripping down your chin. Okay, so let's go ahead. Um, because what I see, and, and I live in Silicon Valley where, you know, uh, we, we have this, this uh, agile metric, I don't know if you guys know about it, it's called employment velocity. Okay, that's number of jobs divided by number of years, or number of companies divided by, it's pretty high because the, the um, survival rate of companies is pretty small, right? A lot of startups, they don't all make it. And often I'm with a team and what we're really focused on, which is great, is velocity, right? But it turns out that velocity isn't sufficient. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. And velocity and, and improvements and throughput and getting the team working great is all wonderful. And it's about how do we build it faster and bit with better quality. But it makes a couple of assumptions. And one of the assumptions it makes is that we're actually building the thing the market wants. <laughs> right? We, we've got some strategic prioritization. We've got some market outcomes. And when we finish this thing, it's going to lead to an outcome which for most companies is translated as what? Sales. Sales. Money. Right? Money is an important concept here. Right? And so, so the question we want to ask, I think, for the next half hour, 35 minutes, whatever it is, is when we're looking at that little number in the corner of the card or in the corner of the spreadsheet that got thrown over the wall from finance from somebody that we may not meet for a while, and we call it business value, does it still taste like customer success? Right? Because maybe we've lost the flavor here. So, and, and by the way, um, I brought some books to give away. You already, come up at the end, you'll get the first book. No, no need to do it now, right? Because you already got the answer, which was, um, you know, about the frozen stuff. But here's, here's my point, and it's, it seems worth asking sort of the beginning of every week or maybe the beginning of every sprint, which is, are the things we're building actually of value to actual customers? Do they matter? Are they going to lead to improvement or change or good things for our organization? Or are they just something on the list? Because, um, again, I spend a lot of my time with folks who brilliantly built things that nobody wants. Right? And there's nothing sadder or more wasteful. By the way, when we talk about waste, this is the 100% waste opportunity. Okay? Let's build something with quality, on time, on spec, you know, zero defects. And the silence is deafening. Okay? Because if the market doesn't want it, it doesn't matter. Right? So I'm always worried about the big throw in the, in the trash can here of, did I, on the product side, ask for something which doesn't move the needle? which doesn't bring customer joy, which doesn't generate revenue, which doesn't attract people from the competition to us because we're doing something that people really care about. If we're doing stuff that doesn't matter, then it doesn't matter how well we do it. So uh, let's keep going in here. By the way, so this was exactly the package you were thinking of, right? Um, it's Neapolitan ice cream. It's 0.7 ounces, right? You can tear it off. And anybody else tasted this stuff? OK, pretty impressive, right? All right, so, um, so here, here's my setup, and then we'll, we'll knock it down and take it apart again, right? What I see over and over again is I see organizations where we have these two disparate towers, right? We've got the business, which is the people who are in charge of some kind of product line somewhere and bringing in money. And we've got the team or the developers or the IT organization or the engineers over here um, building something. And we've built these, we either built organizational walls or we've left big organizational gaps, right? In, in space terms, this is being on different planets, right? We don't talk, or if we do, the communications are really slow because it takes a long time to bounce back and forth, right? And the second thing I see all the time is that we have someone who's assigning value, right? So there is no project which is going to get worked on if we don't assign value to it. So therefore, we have to assign value, right? Give me a number. Or, and if it isn't a big enough number, by the way, we're not doing it. So give me a bigger number, right? <laughs> um, keep going, right? A little higher, a little higher, right? Uh, until we get to one that gets approved, right? And it's less about market outcomes than it is about um, getting the thing into the process, right? And so that leads us to do something which on the development side we figured out maybe in 2006 some of us was really hard, which is doing all the estimates up front and having them be perfect, 
right? Anybody in the business of doing estimates up front and having them be perfect? Not so easy, right? Well, it turns out on the, on the business value side, we're in the same place we're just 10 years later, right? Because if we don't put a good business value on it, then it doesn't get done, right? It doesn't get in the stack, doesn't work its way up the heap. And so as a business leader, I'm incented to put a big number on it, right? And fix it at the end, because if we change it, we're in trouble. Um, uh, the next thing, of course, is uh, we're going to prioritize unlike things. Should we fix one more bug or work on one more feature or do some R&D or upgrade our systems? Right? And that's a really hard question to ask if we're trying to put everything on one set of denominators here. Right? They're all in the same value points. So we have to find some exchange mechanism that says one more bug is worth a quarter of a, of a story, right? a quarter of a feature. or five sixteenths of some R&D, right? Really hard to do. Um, so, and the last one is, you know, we get back to the same question, right? We're still on ice cream, which is, um, are the paying customers, and we're going to define paying customers in a sec, really actually enjoying what it is that we're delivering? Because if they're not, um, well, in my valley, actually, I should ask, anybody old enough to know what the last punch card in the stack said? <laughs> It Even before, what, did it, what, what, what were the three letters on the last punch card? E-O-J. E e Who is that? Okay, book for you, right? E-O-J, and it stood for? End of, job. End of job. Okay, in my valley, if you're building stuff that the customers don't think is tasty, it's end of job, <laughs> right? Different punch card, um, same valley. Okay, good. So let's keep going. So. Um, Therefore, what I, what I get out of this, and anybody recognize this phrase in this picture? Okay. I'm going to take issue with some words here, right? And the, and the first words I'm going to say is the customer. And I will claim that what we're not talking about is somebody else in your company in some business unit who's in charge of a product. Okay. What we're talking about, if you're in the hotel business, your customer is the person who sleeps in your hotel. Right? If you're in the airline business, it's the person who's struggling to get a bag into the overhead compartment. Right? If you're in the credit card business, as many of you are here in the banking business, it's people who actually have cards with stripes on them and now little chips and they're striping them and they're chipping them and they're making transactions. Right? The customer is not somebody in the business unit who's telling you about uh, PII requirements. The customer is the person who pays our salary and if they don't do it, we're out of a job. In the social networking business, the customer is somebody who's clicking the like and the, well, what are, what are they going to call the new Facebook button? Unlike, Unlike dislike, <laughs> dissimilar, whatever, right? So, so the customer in, in the social game is the person who's spending attention, right? And the customer in the business to business is the person who's buying our networking gear. Or if you're in the CRM business, has a sales team who's putting their data in and trying to close deals, right? The customer is somebody who exchanges value with your company. And when we talk about the customer as being this intermediate person over in some business unit, I think we lose our chance. And so valuable means they care about it, right? All right. Uh, so um, here's, our, here's our bit of quiz here. Um, Freeze-dried raspberry powder. Anybody tasted this stuff? <laughs> That's a mango behind it. Okay, so, so here's the bit of quiz. Um, we're going to put up some different kinds of business value, and we're going to try to ask why it has business value. All right. So um, new products and services, right? This is really all about a promise of the future. Right? Um, when, we, when we put a business value number on it, what we're talking about is we hope that this will deliver revenue to the company if we deliver a new product, a new service, right? Um, who's at a company where they can accurately forecast revenue next quarter? <laughs> okay? So when you ask your product manager to put a hard number on a feature or a product down to the second decimal place, we're all lying. Okay, because we don't actually even know how much money is coming into the company. But we're going to put a promise on here because we can at least rank order these. We can sort them and say, you know, this one's better ahead, larger than the other ones, right? So what's our next kind of uh, business value? How about uh, workflow improvements, right? Um, we're going to have a better sign-on for our credit card customers. We're going to have a better login and um, 
you know, get on board for our airplane customers. That's a promise of future happiness, okay? How much happiness is it? It's some, right? Uh, can we accurately measure the happiness of our customers? Sometimes we can, but we're not gonna do that stuff. We're not gonna do workflow improvements and add features if we don't think it makes customers happy, right? It's a promise of the future. How about, anybody know about technical debt? Anybody have technical debt? Okay. Why do we work on technical debt? Sorry? Yeah, give me something smaller or simpler that even a product manager can understand. Right? There's a promise when we retire technical debt. What's the promise? Right, the promise is we're going to be able to do stuff faster later on. When we, if, if reducing technical debt, if retiring technical debt doesn't make us faster, we shouldn't do it, right? So there's an implied business value in, in, re, in retiring technical debt. How about test automation and continuous integration and continuous deployment? Why do we do it? Quality and faster, right? So if, if working on this stuff of doing TDD and CI and CD doesn't lead us to faster releases and higher quality, we shouldn't do it, right? And so when we look at Test automation, it's the promise of faster releases, right? How about the last one? Um, I think I've got one more. How about uh, quality reduction, uh, quality improvement, I think. You guys don't do quality reduction, do you? Um, uh, system improvements, what we're talking about here is uh, delivering better throughput or delivering operational savings. Sometimes we can actually measure these, right? Swap out the old VM for the new VM. These are all flavors of business value. Notice that they're a little hard to trade off against each other. Right? But that's okay. And they're all promises of the future. And that's really important because when we believe the business value estimates to two and three and four decimal places, we're just lying to ourselves, right? So we need to know that these are promises of the future and our product managers and product owners and product strategists are doing the best they can. Um, but just as they used to come to us and say, I need an estimate plus or minus 4% for how big this project is, it's gonna take 40 people 13 years, right? And we would say, we actually used to give them those numbers, right? They weren't very good, okay? We're, we're putting our business owners and business managers and product managers in that same place when we say, we need a perfect number, right? Because here's my hypothesis, right? Anybody know this chart? All right, um, what I'm gonna tell you is that um, I've seen, and this is purely unscientific, so you can blame it on me, um, I see business value estimates with big error margins. I picked 70% just for fun, right? And one in 10 is probably an understatement. Anybody have higher than that, where the project delivers no value when we're all done, okay? If you knew that one in 10 or one in five of your projects was gonna deliver no value and that your other business estimates were plus or minus 50 or 80 or 85 or 92%, you know, how would you consider the prioritization process? Would it change your mind? Awfully quiet here. All right, so, so here's our sort of first law of, of software economics and thermodynamics, which is Gosh, I'm getting different things here. Okay, um, so let's talk about what we can do. Let's actually go back, right? So given that we know that the business value is imperfect. Is it imperfect? It isn't. Any product managers in the back who want to argue with me, come see me later, right? Um, uh, the, the question is what do we do, right? And the things we can do to reduce the problem here, to make it better, to get more love and more flavor from our ice cream, is first of all, we want to be actually negotiating the real trade-offs. And I got some thoughts here, which is people come to us and say, well, I need X. And in fact, the wrong answer is no. And the wrong answer is yes. The right answer is, well, we could do that, but here's what we have to give up instead. Because the only real world trade-offs you make are where you give something up and you know what it is, right? The second one, I'm gonna suggest that we wanna make like-to-like -like comparisons. Let's compare all of the bugs and defects together, and let's fix the worst of the bugs and the defects and figure out how much we're willing to spend on bug and defect fixes, and let's not trade off a feature against that because, I don't know if you know this, but everybody on the business side will always choose a feature versus tech debt reduction. Right? And if we leave it up to an individual choice, what we're gonna do is never retire tech debt unless we have a budget for it, right? Um, Reality-based budgeting, um, on the revenue software side where I live, we all know that products live forever until you retire them. 
Sometimes we call that end of life. Sometimes we call it sunsetting, which is a nice word for the same thing, right? But until you stop selling it to customers, you have to keep supporting it. And some of us live in the, in the project world where people think stuff is finished when you ship the first version, right? And that's just a lie. Um, and then the fourth one I think that's really important, and I'm, I'm carefully using the word paying here, everybody in the room should have a chance to meet or listen to or interact with folks who really use our products, really use our services, touch the folks who are going to, well, you don't actually want to touch them if they're going to sleep in our hotel tonight, but you, know, you want to know who they are, right? Because the better we understand the end customers who pay us money, uh, the better off we are in terms of finding the business value that's hidden in the stories we've got. Okay, so. Um, I don't know if you guys know this. This is Boston last year, right? <laughs> um, there's this magical thinking that sometimes happens on the business side with folks who don't know systems so well, which is that they have this belief that with just one more scrum team, we can dig ourselves out of all of the requirements and all of the demands, right? Um, it turns out um, I can think of new features for your product or service faster than you can build them. By the way, so can everybody else on your business side. So the idea that we're actually going to catch up, not so much, right? So again, it comes really back to hard prioritization because the magical thinking that says somehow we're going to get everything done never, never happens, right? In fact, if I, um, here's my magical thinking slide, right? Anybody know these words? <laughs> I, I, I put listening devices in a bunch of conference rooms around the world, and here's the things I heard, right? Um, it's really important. Good to know. What's it more important than, right? Um, my favorite, of course, is the how hard could it be? It's probably only 10 lines of code. Anybody, <laughs> anybody know the answer to this? When, when a salesperson from your software company comes to you and says, I just came out of a meeting with Deutsche Bank, and by the way, we promised them teleportation, and <laughs> how hard could it be? It's probably only 10 lines of code. What is the, anybody know the answer to this? What's the correct response? That's a book for you, by the way. The answer is, great, why don't you sit right here <laughs> and code it for us, right? How hard could it be, right? Um, it is uniformly true that folks who don't understand how systems are built think things are easy, right? Um, we've, right? we've gone agile, so therefore we must have indicated. We, we can replan next week, so my thing must get in, right? Um, and and this, is the, um, this is the Home Depot model that says, um, <laughs> If I, if I drive my truck down to the Home Depot, there's a bunch of folks I can hire for, well, for cash, right? Less than 10 bucks an hour. And they can type on keyboards just as well as you guys can, right? Um, magical thinking is all about the problem of um, the trade-off's not obvious, the work's not obvious. And it puts us in this, this uh, and universe where we could just, it's just one more, right? How hard could it be, right? So, um, I'm always talking about the exclusive or trade-off, right? You guys know about Boolean logic, right? So most of, uh, it, anybody been in sales? Okay, sales is not a Boolean logic kind of world, right? <laughs> <laughs> sales is an and world, right? Because you come back from the customer and there are things you need that are not in the product. And if you can convince someone to say yes, then you get to go to club in Hawaii and drive the fast car, right? So. Um, we need to know that real trade-offs are about exclusive ors. They're about or, not and. And so when we present them in that format, we say, well, that's a great idea. I love your idea. That's a terrific idea. Gosh, you're smart and good looking. <laughs> but <laughs> if we're going to work on that, here are the things we have to throw under the bus. And here are all the customers that are not going to get what they wanted. And here's the releases that are not going to happen. And by the way, I know I've seen the movie, but teleportation is more than 10 lines of code, right? You really want to have the or discussion. Here's what we were planning on Monday at the staff meeting, and I'm happy to entertain this, but here's what we've got to take out, right? What would we drop? What like things would we take out? And we want to avoid the yes, we'll push all the quality things under the bus this quarter, but we'll come back to it next quarter, right? Uh, by the way, um, I don't know if anybody knows this. There's scientific proof that there are no health benefits to joining a gym. You guys know this? Anybody want to help me? 
you got to go, right? Joining a gym has no health benefits. And in late January and early February of every year, everybody's coming off the holidays, everybody joins a gym, right? Turns out, no health benefits unless you go. And the theory that says, I'm really busy this week, and we've got some planning, and I'm working late, and whatever, and I'm going to go to the gym next week, right? Turns out not to be that useful, right? And, and just as the theory that says, this quarter, it's really important that we get all these features done in this quarter, whatever. And so we're going to push back all the quality and test automation and CI, CD, and tech debt reduction till next quarter. Uh, there's a pattern here, right? When we do it that way, we end up with, well, I predate the lean movement, I think is how we say that, right? Okay. <laughs> right. So we want to put trade-offs on the table where they're clear, and then we all make good decisions, right? Let's keep going. All right, so when I look at, and by the way, this is my pie for a revenue software company, and the distinction I make here is there's some companies that ship software for money, right? And there's some companies that ship software to support the other business that they're in. And I think most of us here are in um, software supporting businesses instead of the pure software business. But when I take apart a company that builds databases or database tools or software for, what I see is about half the story points every quarter being spent on features. Right? And I see about 15% maybe, depends on the company, on things like test automation. And there's a bunch of management overhead and training and you know, we've got stuff to do, systems to upgrade, a little bit of future R&D. And there's almost always about a 20% slice of things that we call one-offs. And a one-off, anybody know what a one-off is? It's when that really, really smart salesperson comes in and says, I just got off the phone with Goldman Sachs and convinces everybody that we're going to do this one thing and how hard could it be and it's only going to take a couple of days. And when you add them up, it turns out it's 20 or 25 or 30 percent of your quarter's budget, right? And so we have to deal with them as a group instead of one at a time because we just get rolled forward and rolled forward, right? And we give them up one at a time because we don't have the or choice here. Um, let's keep going. All right, so, so I get to, to my second recommendation, which is priority within buckets. And, and I find this really works, particularly with executives. Anybody an executive here? I should be careful. Usually we describe executives as folks who um, are limiting themselves to three bullet points with no more than eight words each, right? We're really busy. Um, <laughs> I were a uh, executive, but I aren't one now. Um, but if we put things in buckets and we say, you know, we're going to spend 15 or 20 percent of our valuable story points this quarter on tech debt reduction and test automation, and we're going to hold the line there, and we'll put them on whatever parts of tech debt reduction and test automation are going to be best, we make progress, right? Buckets really matter here because they help us defend ourselves from the, the household budget problem. I have a daughter who used to be a teenager, and she would come home and say, well, there's this concert, and my friends would really like to go, and the tickets aren't really that. Taylor Swift was here the other night, right? Yep. What were those tickets priced at? Right, so how much could it be, right? It's just me and my nine friends, right? <laughs> and it turns out in San Francisco, if you spend that much on a concert, uh, the next month you're living in a cardboard box because that's what rent costs, right? Um, budgeting problems are real, and so if we think about them that way, we get the right trade-offs. Um, okay, prioritization. Th this is another trap that I see, which is we believe our algorithms. Okay, we're doing weighted shortest job. Anybody do weighted shortest job first? Okay, that's great. Do you believe it? Mostly. Okay. What I'll tell you is that, that the algorithms we have are pretty good because remember the error bars are big and they get us most of the way there. They get us the good candidates. They get us to the top of the list. But business value is harder to nail down even than development estimates. And so what we really want to do is we want to quick sort the good stuff and we want to get the tough people around the table and have the wrestling match. Hopefully there's no screaming. Uh, in my organization, there's no hitting, okay, and no throwing food, right? But we want to share our feelings and get it done, right? Um, you know, so we want to get the live stakeholders, if we can, around the table and make those hard exclusive or trade-offs because otherwise we're mostly making it up, right? And when I see folks who just run it on the numbers, they just take the spreadsheet, hard to see that you get the best result because some of those items, remember we were talking about food, a lot of those items turn out not to be very tasty and some of them have no nutritional value, right? They're just junk points. Um, and so, um, you know, figure out the list and, and then let's get the people involved. If I go back to our Agile Manifesto, we value 
people over processes when there's a conflict, right? This is a people process. Um, uh, here's, we're gonna build a lot of ice cream cones over the next year. So reality-based budget, of course, means that programs or products are things that run for a really long time. And if you're doing project-based budgeting where it all goes to zero after version one, then you're not counting the fact that you're gonna discover things and there's moving standards and, right? There's stuff that happens and as long as the software is out there being deployed and people are using it, we're gonna have an obligation to keep it running, right? Um, so we need to budget that way. We need to budget for real sustaining on our software. We're gonna do it anyway. When I open up a lot of um, IT budgets, what I find is 40 or 45 percent is the, is the black budget, right? It's the unnamed budget for all the things that we said we finished, but we have to keep supporting, right? Anybody still working on products that only support Internet Explorer 7? <laughs> I, I hear Microsoft's going to let go of that soon, so you better get on, right? <laughs> um, everywhere I look, I see software that's been shipwrecked. It's on some island somewhere, right? By the way, the islands are warm and there's no ice cream there. Um, and we haven't budgeted to keep that stuff alive. Okay, so let's keep going. Um, because what we really want, no, not my daughter, but uh, cute anyway, right? What we really want is we want to be getting closer to our paying customers. And here again, stressing the word external, right? That the Capital One folks know that their customers are people who are taking out mortgages or opening bank accounts or taking credit cards and cashing in on all those miles I hear that I get, right? At least the TV tells me, right? Um, and we want to be doing things like measuring customer satisfaction. Why does customer satisfaction matter? Anybody? Sorry? We keep our job. That's right, so we keep our job. So customer satisfaction matters in the, in the world peace sense, we want our customers to be happier. Right? But it turns out in the hard-nosed business sense, we'd also like our customers to be happier because they might stay with us longer and stay our customers. Right? So along the, the, um, the trail here of the breadcrumbs, customer satisfaction is really important. Anybody work in the cable TV industry? Anybody from Comcast here? <laughs> Okay, um, right, measure satisfaction, measure adoption, measure usage, measure revenue, that would be good. And, and let's see if we can figure out how the people in this room can get close enough to the customers to see the joy. Because that's a picture about joy, right? Anybody, you know, it's better if it, if it gets all the way down the clothes and you know, <laughs> mom and dad will wash it, right? So, so here are a few things we can do, because it's fine to talk about this stuff, but what are things we could do today, this week, when you get back to your office? to put the flavor back in the business value to, uh, to make the ice cream tasty again. So the first one for me is, if you're talking with your product managers or your product strategists or the folks on the business side, I think you should ask the money question if they haven't, right? They should want to talk about the money question, but everybody is allowed to say, hmm, how does this lead to a better outcome for my company? Because if it doesn't, and nobody in the room knows how, Maybe it's not so important, we can skip to the next thing. Now, give our product management folks lots of slack because there's huge error bars on how this is gonna work. But if we can't attach money to it and we're a profit-making venture, get to ask the question again. Okay, um, second one. Anybody in this room who doesn't use your own products, you really should. Now, sometimes that's hard. I did some work with the folks at Varian who make the big uh, cancer therapy machines that save lives and cure diseases and I didn't offer to try that product. <laughs> but you should at least know how it works. You know, if you're in any kind of consumer product, run it, taste it, run the error messages, get in there, right? You should understand what your company does. You should have a good feeling in your gut for what good looks like. Um, next one, and I put an asterisk here we're gonna get to in a second, which is find a way, and it depends on your company, your market, to really listen in on the customer conversations. Now maybe that's folks coming into your every other week demo and customer showcase and maybe it's going down to the customer support area and putting on the second set of headphones and listening and maybe it's going on the sales call if you're in enterprise software right? and maybe it's, you figure it out, right? Anybody wanna help me with the asterisk? Okay, there's rules here, go ahead. Yeah, the user experience folks do all kinds of this stuff. Right, and I bet they videotape some of them Lots of notes right. invite people to watch. And you invite people to watch. So everybody else in the room who's not watching, you're invited to watch. Please watch. Um, 
I spend a lot of time with enterprise software teams and there's special rules here. Okay, so the first time we invite a software developer along on a sales call <laughs> with some enterprise CIO who's gonna spend seven or eight figures on a product, uh, anybody wanna tell me what the rules are? Don't talk, right? So the first rule is you may not say anything, right? Don't talk. Second rule is also don't talk, right? Um, the third rule is you're allowed to answer a question if it comes from the product manager in the room. And if it's a yes or no, answer, uh, yes or no question, the two choices are yes and no. And among the phrases you're not allowed to say, right? So, sorry? It depends. It depends, yeah. No, the, no, the, the biggest phrases that you want to warn people against, one is, Piece of cake, no problem. I'll have that in the product by Friday, okay? The second one is, no, let me explain why that's a really stupid idea. And the third one is, well, you know, our competitor's product does that pretty well, right? Because when you're in a sales meeting, you're there to help sell, right, or at least to listen. So uh, there's always a little prep session. There's charm school that we always do before we take our development teams out to meet customers. but. Do this, do this, do this, do this. This is really important. If you don't have a sense of the flavor of how people are talking about it, then you may just be going through the motions, right? Okay, um, ask for success metrics, right? Anybody working on stuff and you're not sure what good looks like, right? You're allowed to ask the success metrics question which says, hmm, how do we know this is gonna work? If this is an experiment, what does passing and failing look like, right? If we're gonna increase our sign up rates or our flow in activities or our conversions, um, how are we measuring it, right? Because if we're not measuring it, then maybe it's not so tasty, right? Um, and, and again, I would, I would look at the revenue question, which is how does your company pay itself? Um, somewhere in some big glass office somewhere, people are talking about revenue, right? And you'd really like to understand how that works because that's how decisions get made, right? Okay, so, um, and the last one, that's, that's supposed to be um, fireworks anyway. Um, you should really celebrate with your team. So whenever something good happens that you think customers are gonna like the taste of, I think there's an opportunity here, right? I don't know if it's t-shirts, but maybe it's ice cream sundaes, right? Um, we should be celebrating not just completing a bunch of story points and putting a bunch of business value numbers on the board. We should be finding ways to make this real to our teams, right? Anybody who's an Agile coach here knows this already. The most important thing you can do to help developers motivate themselves is? Celebrate. Celebrate, yeah. It's actually to show them or tell them that real people are using the code they built, right? Because that's why they're doing it. So we want to find an opportunity to celebrate the good things we're doing that are gonna add flavor and value to our customers uh, as often as we can, because that's what we're trying to motivate. Okay, so here's my takeaways. Fresh fruit, by the way. I, I, I reversed the process before we freeze dried it, right? Um, business value is clearly essential, and I put it in capital letters here, but I think there's lots of flavors of it. And I think blending them gets really hard. Um, and you know, the precision for auto sort, I think is just not there. And so when we want to outsource our decision making to a spreadsheet or an algorithm, I think we get ourselves in trouble, right? It'll get us part of the way there, it'll get us most of the way there, but getting the other people on board in front of us, with us, to make the hard decisions together is always better than action at a distance, right? Um, and then of course, you know, you want to taste what customers are tasting. Um, really, really important because when you're doing that, you've got a much better sense of both what's important and how to build it, right? If you know your customers well, the individuals who are gonna struggle with whatever your application is, if you're doing mortgage, anybody here working on mortgage processing? Okay, right, a lot of pain on your customer side. I hope you guys are, are cutting through this because I've been through this a couple of times and I used to be six foot seven. Um, <laughs> it's not easy and understanding the pain on the customer side is as important as understanding the FHA requirements and what all the rules say because it's hard on the customer side. So sampling what they taste and seeing if we can deliver something that's a little tastier I think is the, is the winning answer to putting the flavor back into the business value. Okay, that's me. Um, I know we gave away some books. <clears throat> we got a little time left. Um, 
come find me. Uh, anybody who didn't get a book, drop me a note, drop me a LinkedIn. I'm happy to send you the Kindle bits because they're mine. And uh, feel free to, to come find me afterwards. Do we want to take questions or we just want to break? So, thank you. thank you, Rich. Thank you. So we're going to take a few uh, questions. Um, we've got a couple of runners out here, and um, they're grabbing the mics. So we have, oh, wow, look at this. Okay. Nice and bold question. Hold, hold tight until we get the, the mics up. I got a big one. Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, no, we no, no, we, we want to get this on video. So. Uh, <laughs> I can repeat the question. How's that? Okay. Go. Uh, so you're saying stay away from the, the spreadsheet. So that takes us out of the data-driven world into basically personality-driven world. Right. So how do you get sanity back into the so, process? So I, I carefully didn't say throw away the spreadsheet. What I said was that the spreadsheet gets you 80% there. Right? And, and I think the spreadsheets are important and the data is important and the data-driven world is important and evidence and A-B testing are critical and we should run on the numbers. My caution is we shouldn't believe them that much. Right? I find that, that I can sort the bottom 70 or 80 or 85 percent away, which by the way we're never going to do because it's still snowing, right? but that the top six things have a lot of interesting dimensions to them and they have a lot of dependencies and interactions and the different people want different things and value them slightly differently and that to settle out between priority one, priority two, and priority three, I don't just run it on the numbers, right? So we're taking candidates here to get to the debate, but I'm letting, I'm letting the candidates talk just a little bit. Next question. <clears throat> and no, personalities aren't a winner over data. Because whoever has the, the biggest salary ends up with the biggest opinion. Uh, so you talked a lot about um, getting in touch with your paying customers. You, you yes. used that expression a number of times. So in the enterprise world, very often the paying customer, the person who's signing the check, is not the person using the product. Correct. How do you reconcile that? <coughs> right. And I, I think in, in the, and sometimes we call it the users and the choosers problem, right? So in the enterprise world, yeah, you have people who, make the purchase agreement, you know, who sign the PO and never use the product, um, you have to actually be in touch with both. So in general, you know, there's people in the purchasing organization who only buy based on discount and don't care about the product. There's people who run large organizations who are taking recommendations from champions inside. And you've got the folks who really use the product. In the short term, often you can make the sale just with the choosers or the executives or the buyers. In the long term, that sinks you because you, the users of the product have to really not complain so much. In the enterprise, often they don't love it, but you want them complaining less about your product than the competing product. So wearing my product hat, I have to both understand the buying criteria, which is often the back page of the data sheet for things that nobody's going to ever use, and the user criteria, which is how real people get there. So you're exactly right. So not necessarily a question, but a kind of a supporting comment. Oh, good, um, thanks. In, in both of those areas, was um, one of the strategies I've used as a coach is to, as a team, let's reach out to our business and let's find real end user success stories. It not only motivates our teams, as a point <coughs> you made, but it helps to give us real concrete examples of why things are important to our business. So I, I really focus a lot on a way to get customers on and the business on board is to reach out and ask the questions as a team. Don't be shy. Right. You know, can we see real live customer satisfaction? Because at the end of the day, it's about satisfying the customer. Indeed, exactly. And, and I'm always a little wary about the teams that only get to meet the two customers who come into their uh, demo every two weeks. Because it turns out those customers are as far from representative as you can imagine, because they're the two that love you the most in the whole world want the most technical enhancements and are never going to reinstall from scratch. And they are completely unlike the 10,000 customers you'd like to close who aren't that interested in you and if it doesn't work so much, they can throw it aside. So you know, we, we've got to get ourselves out of just the couple of folks who come to us and, and reach out to the big wide world out there. Maybe one more question before we move on to the next. Do you have any more going? 
Tony? All right. Gone. So thank you, Rich. Sure, thank you.